G'day guys, we've got a physics question today on the motion of satellites. The question asks us, what is the height above the Earth's surface of a communication satellite if it always orbits above the same spot on the equator? Now just before we get going guys, um, if this video does end up helping you, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel. I'm only a small channel so every new subscriber really does help put my videos in front of new eyeballs. So just a quick aside note guys, I've made a fully worked solution in a PDF document which I have provided a link to in the description below. So if you want to check that out so you don't have to write down what I'm writing down, go right ahead. So there are two main things, guys, that we have to consider when we're doing questions of this nature. Because the satellite is always above the same spot on the equator, we refer to this type of satellite as a geosynchronous satellite. Now, as a result, the period of one revolution of the satellite around the Earth's surface is the same as the period of one revolution of the Earth, i.e. 24 hours or 86,400 seconds. So let's just write that down. Cool, now for our second point guys, the information that will be required relates to the fact that this satellite is geosynchronous. In the case of a geosynchronous satellite, the gravitational force of attraction between the Earth and the satellite must be equal to the force required to keep the satellite in its current circular orbit or the centripetal force required at this particular distance above the Earth's centre. So, the force of attraction between the two objects or the gravitational force, we're calling that Fg, must be equal to the centripetal force which is required to keep it in this constant stable circular orbit. So from here, guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just write down the formulas I'm going to use to calculate both the gravitational force of attraction as well as the centripetal force, which results from the satellite's circular motion. For the gravitational force of attraction, I'm going to use Newton's law of universal gravitation, which states that every particle in the universe attracts every other particle in the universe with a force that is proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So simply put, the gravitational force of attraction or Fg is equal to the universal gravitational constant multiplied by the mass of the first object times the mass of the second object divided by the square of the distance between each of the object's center of mass or the radius. Cool. And for our centripetal force, or the force required to keep this satellite in a circular motion, we're going to say that's equal to simply the mass of whatever object is going in the circular motion times the velocity of the object squared divided by the radius of the arc of the circle. Now we've established what formulas we're going to use, guys. Let's just substitute both of these into our equality that we have on the left-hand side in blue here. So for... The force of attraction or the gravitational force of attraction, we're going to use Newton's law of universal gravitation. And for the mass of the first object, we're going to call this the mass of the Earth. And for the mass of the second object, we'll call this the mass of the satellite. And this is going to have to be equal to the force required to keep the satellite in a circular motion or the centripetal force. And for this mass here, it's going to be the mass of the satellite. Cool. Now for me guys, the next step is always to get rid of any duplicated variables we have on each side. So variables that if we take them to the other side, they will cancel each other out. So you can see guys, if I divide both sides by the mass of the satellite, the masses of the satellites will inevitably cancel out on either side. So I'm just going to put a nice big red line through them. And also if I multiply the radius from the right hand side over to the left hand side, I'm going to cancel out one of the the radius squareds that I have down the bottom on the left hand side. So I'm going to put a big red line through that radius and the two on the left hand side. Cool, so let's just rewrite that with the variables that we have remaining. Great, so it looks like we're getting somewhere. Now guys, for me the next step is just to make a list or jot down the variables which we already know that we can then input into this simplified formula. So then we can start to play around with the variables we don't know and try and solve them. Now the first one we know is the gravitational constant or the universal gravitational constant uppercase G which is equal to, to three significant figures, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. 
Now this constant does not have any units, it's just 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. So let's just write that one down. And the next variable that we are already aware of is the mass of the Earth. People have worked that out before us. Now again, to three significant figures, the mass of the Earth is 5.98 times 10 to the power of 24 kilograms. So after I've written down the variables that I already have, the first variable that I'm going to attack and try and solve is this velocity of the satellite variable. So we all know that velocity of any kind of object is equal to its displacement, or the distance it travels, divided by the time in which it takes to travel it. Now in the case of this satellite, the distance that the satellite is going to travel in one rotation is going to be equal to the circumference of the circle of radius r, or the same radius as we have on the left hand side here. So rather than writing s, I'm going to write the circumference of this circular orbit, or 2 times pi times the radius of the orbit, divided by the time in which it takes to do one full revolution, or one full orbit, which is going to be because it's a geosynchronous satellite, 86,400 seconds. Cool, so now I have a statement for velocity in terms of simply the radius. So now I've narrowed my unknown variables from two, radius and velocity, to simply one, the radius. So let's input this into our simplified formula over here. And from here, I'm going to take the squared on the outside of this bracket and take it inside using an index law. I can just take the index of two and place on all of the components within the bracket. Cool, so two squared is four, pi squared is pi squared, r squared is r squared, and rather than writing what the actual value of 86,400 squared is, I'm just gonna keep it as 86,400 squared. So. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take all of the unknown values to the right hand side, take all of the known values to the left hand side, and substitute the known values that I have over here into our formula. So I've taken my 86,400 to the left, my 4 pi squared to the left, and the radius which is in the denominator on the left, I've taken that to the right. So I can then input the values for the universal gravitational constant as well as the mass of the Earth. And from here, guys, in order to get the distance between the two centers of mass of both the satellite as well as the Earth, I'm going to take the cube root of both sides. So on the right-hand side, I'm simply left with the radius. And from here, guys, we're able to ascertain that the distance between the two objects' center of mass, or R, as we're writing it in this formula, is equal to 4.225 times 10 to the power of 7 meters. So one of the biggest mistakes that I see a lot of students make when they attack problems like this is they leave their solution as this 4.225 times 10 to the power of 7 meters. Now what we need to consider is this number here represents the distance from the center of mass of both objects, i.e. the center of mass of the Earth and the center of mass of the satellite. Now the question is asking what is the height above the Earth's surface of a communications satellite? So we have to consider the radius of the Earth, i.e. the distance from the center of the Earth or the center of mass of the Earth to the Earth's surface. So what we've just found, like I said before, is we've found the distance between the center of mass of the Earth and the center of mass of the satellite. So what we'll usually get in a formulas sheet or some kind of constant sheet, or even at the end of the question, you'll get a figure for the radius of the Earth. And in this case, we're going to say that the radius of the Earth is equal to 6.38 times 10 to the six meters. And finally, guys, to find the height of the communications satellite above the Earth's surface, what we're going to do is we're going to get the total distance between the two center of masses, i.e. 4.225 times 10 to the 7, and then we're simply going to subtract the radius of the Earth from that. And that will give us this figure here, which I've denoted H. So like I said before, the height above the Earth's surface is going to be equal to the larger distance, 4.225 times 10 to the 7, subtract the radius of the Earth, which finally comes to 3.4. 
0.59 times 10 to the 7 meters or 35,900 kilometers. That's my take on the classical geosynchronous satellite problem. They do come up a lot in high school physics tests and exams, so I think it's a good idea to ensure that you have a fairly deep understanding on how the problem works. And as the cliche goes, guys, practice makes perfect. If you keep bashing your head against the wall, eventually the wall will fall down. But on an important side note, just while I remember, guys, one of the things I forgot to include at the start of this problem but you know it's quite easy to see once you, the, you look at the algebra, is that the mass of the satellite doesn't really make any difference. So if they include the mass of the satellite in your question as a piece of information, it's just auxiliary information. It can be discarded. It's not important at all, unless you're trying to calculate the actual force of gravity or the actual centripetal force. If you're just looking for the height above the Earth's surface, the mass of the satellite is not important at all. So finally, guys, just a little reminder that I have made a PDF of a fully worked solution to this problem available at a link in the description below. And please, guys, if the video did help, make sure you like and subscribe to my channel. The only way that channels like mine grow is if people like yourselves, I don't need your money, but if you can recommend this channel to your friends and encourage that they subscribe, I'd really, really appreciate it. So until next time, guys, just keep practicing, practicing, practicing. But most of all, just ensure you keep enjoying your physics. And I'll see you next time.